the Australian uh, institutes are using. So differential set is a, a set of lines which are having individual resistant genes in their blood. So only a single gene. So that ex exact single gene will give different phenotypic expression when you inoculate with uh, different kinds of pathotypes. Individual pathotypes will give you different kinds of reaction, different scores. Based on that, you will identify what is the gene is present. For example, uh, I will give you an example uh, for the gene pastulation. This works on the principle of gene for gene hypothesis, what we know uh, already. So you will get different kinds of reactions of differentials and the line of your uh, question, the line which you want to know what gene is there inside it. So the next thing uh, after the gene postulation, you know there is a resistant gene, you postulated it, you imagine, you guess that it is a new gene. What is your next step is to develop a population. You cross the gene, uh, the plant, which is having that particular gene with resistant uh, susceptible plant, and you will develop mapping population. You can get, uh, we have a lot, many number of options to develop mapping population. This will always uh, depend on uh, the trait of your uh, interest and what is the genetics of uh, that trait. It will differ when you concentrate on two genes, if uh, two genes are there in the um, one line, or if it is a single gene is segregating, or if it is more than one gene, or it is having a QTL, or like APR, you all know what is ASR and APR. APR is a major gene and QTL is the minor genes. So we have uh, real recombinant inbred lines. From F2, you will go using C single seed descent method. You will go from here until uh, F6, and you will get the reals. And BC1, F1, you go for one back rush, and you just uh, self it the back rush. Then you will get BC1, F2. We also call it as a Bills back rush inbred lines. And the other one is double upload. It's uh, quite easy when you get when you have a protocol for transformation. Uh, sorry, you have a protocol for haploid culture and you do it as a multi in multi uh, um, doubling and then you will de develop a double haploid. In wheat, it is there, maize uh, and wheat uh, system we have for double haploid production that I will explain in future slides. So the choice of uh, mapping population, once we talk about mapping population, what we get? So how, why uh, we can't go for mapping in parental population or why we can't go for mapping in F2. F2 you can go for map, uh, mapping, but until and unless you have a replicate of it. So you can have a clone of the F2, and you replicate it, and you can map it. But in F2 you can't go for replication, no, until, unless you do not have a clone. And the use of uh, F2 derived F3, and BC1 F2, they have a different objectives of that. So you will be having one resistant parent and one susceptible parent. They are having a different kinds of blood in their, uh, this one and you are interested in target gene, and you cross them, blood will be same until this generation. If you pull P1 and P2 DNA, and you pull RILS DNA, it will be same. But there is a recombination is happening in the generations, generation over the generations. Genes, stripes, and the markers, they are segregating within the, uh, through meiosis. So it will be recombined in the real population. Then you will look for what are all the markers which are co-segregating with your trait of interest? If you get one or two markers which are exactly uh, uh, typing your phenotype, then that would be a good validation for your work. Double upload, as far as double upload considered, uh, is concerned, uh, there are many works have been done using double uploads, but only the lacking of double upload is uh, that number of recombinants you are allowing, recombination processes you are allowing it to, until you develop it as a real. So there are five, six generation of recombination is happening. You are giving chance for the marker and the gene of your interest to go separated. But they are not separating, and they are falling in the same blocks. So in double upload, there is only one recombination which happens. Uh, so that's a lack of that. But it's a very quick process to uh, develop the population. Once you have a population, then you will analyze. You have a mapping population F2 or F3, then you will analyze what is the genetics of that gene, whether it is a major gene, whether it is a QTL, whether one gene is there or two genes are there. Based on the segregation pattern, what you get in F2 or F2 derived F3 or BC1 F2. So I could not make this one uh, on uh, PowerPoint, so I wrote it. So if you see why we have to go for F3, F3 is very easy to when it is a single gene and you need very uh, less number of uh, lines to predict. 
because you will be having one homozygous resistant if single gene is there and a uh, few uh, uh, F2 plants will be segregating one is to one and uh, you will be having a susceptible, it's a, a very easy one. So when you compare uh, F3 and F BC1, F2, there are two things, there are two genes in one resistant line, you develop a population F3 or BC2, BC F2, BC1, F2. This is for BC1, F2. So in the F2, what we get the gamete is nine out of 16 will be resistant, uh, resistant for heterozygote for both the genes, uh, uh, you know, both the genes resistance will be there. And uh, the second one is resistant for the first gene. And the third one is resistant for the second gene. And the fourth one is, it's susceptible. So these kind of segregation you will get and you have to isolate single gene lines. You can't map two genes all together and it will segregate in reals one is to one is to one is to one. So once you get into F2, you have to segregate if two genes here, you have to isolate them into two single populations, single gene segregating populations. That will be very easy in F3 because one out of four will be resistant for first gene and one out of four plants resistant for second gene. Here, three out of 16, you know? So number of lines which you need to extract the single gene uh, lines is less in uh, BC1, F2. And most of the cases, uh, this is the uh, donor parent and recipient parent susceptible plant. And uh, when you go for BC1, F2, you will be having 75% blood of the recipient, the susceptible plant. So you are analyzing those two genes in the background of susceptible parent. So that will give you a different kind of uh, information. And that can be taken forward if you want to make it as a uh, population which can be uh, for marker assisted. If susceptible parent is a good cultivar, very good variety as far as yield, consider, yield is concerned, and if you want to take it forward as a uh, combination, then you can use this one. So double applied, I told, recombination is the issue in that. Once genetic analysis is done, you know whether it is a single gene are two genes. So you have a mapping population with you. So it's not moving. So next is you have to locate that gene. You know the resistant gene, you know it is single gene or two genes and you have to locate the gene. Next is location of gene. Go back one step. Yeah, stop it. So you understood, in identification or discovery of gene, first is gene postulation. You know there is resistance, there is novel gene. Then you go for development mapping population for resistant line. Then you go. So selective genotyping, nowadays everyone is doing because 200 lines you have, the only uh, thing is cost. We can't genotype, we can send it 200 lines for 90,000, 90k chip, or you can't send it for 9k chip because you do not have many. 
India, in India, we do not have 90K, we have 35K. 35K means we have 35,000 K chip. So I have a mapping population. I have developed, developed a reel. I want to send it. It's 200 mapping uh, reel lines. And individually, uh, so we have in India at the moment, 35K is, it is coming to 13 lakhs per plate. Just you can genotype 390 lines, uh, 80 plus lines uh, in 13 lakh rupees. That's very uh, cost. Uh, it's, it's too cost for us. What we can do is you can select 10 of uh, homozygous resistant, 10 of homozygous susceptible lines, and you genotype them for 90K or 9K. Then you will get the genomic uh, that information. Then you put it together, uh, and you can map it based on the uh, polymorphism. So after knowing the location, like it is present on 7D, you know that it is the gene of your interest is present on 7D. So you have to map it. So in breeding, what happens is identification, mapping, and introgression. If you stop any place, at any place, it's useless. You will identify gene. You will not go for mapping. It's useless. If you identify gene, you map it. You don't put it into cultivars. You are not putting it to, you are not introducing it to cultivars, and you are not taking it to the farmer's field. It's useless. So next step is the mapping. Mapping is something. You know it is present on 7D, but you don't know exactly where it is sitting on the 7D. It is long arm of the chromosome or the short arm of the, of the, of the chromosome. Then there are two methods of doing this one. If it is a major gene, it's very easy. You can do it bulk segment analysis or selective genotyping. You will get the phenotypic data. You put genotypic data next to that. You will identify out of 90,000 markers, how many markers are sitting on 7D, because that location is on 7D. Then you will see how many number of SNPs which are sitting next to the gene of your interest. Then you will make a map of that. Then use those SNPs and you prepare your own primers for that mar those markers. And you run it on the whole mapping population. The second one is mapping QTL. Uh, mapping major gene, you can do it under control conditions, under glasses conditions. Mapping QTL, you have to analyze it in multi-location trials or in uh, number of years to get the accurate data. We have different kinds of QTLs, minor QTL, if it is phenotypic variation showing is less than 10%, and major if it is more than 10%. And we have a lot of softwares. We normally use QTL cartographer, ICIM. It's very easy to use for anyone. Uh, anyone of us we can use we, if we have a genotypic and phenotypic data. So mapping QTL is very easy, even using bulk segment analysis, if it is an additive kind of QTL. We have three kinds of QTL, additive, dominant, and uh, epistatic. Additive is very easy to do and uh, followed by dominant and next one is epistatic. So this is a, a kind of example I'm giving you what we did there uh, when I was there. So we screened and characterized 12 F3 populations. So what we did is we took germplasm. Earlier uh, they had developed a population. They screened it. They did a postulation study and after that they uh, know that there is some resistant genes in these populations. I'm not giving you the name of populations because not yet published data, so we can't uh, reveal here. So they were all, most of them were F3, and one was uh, forwarded to F6. It was in F6. F3, you can predict the gene, how many number of genes. So for this particular, this one, yellow rust, we predicted two genes maybe there based on the segregation, how it is giving in F3. And one more uh, population, we predicted recessive gene because it was segregating in one is to, uh, sorry, three is to one. One is resistant and three is susceptible because it is a dominant gene is susceptible. So we predicted one gene here. So there were two uh, lines I was using. They were the varieties of India and uh, they were segregating for some uh, single genes. So we predicted single gene here. So the same population, uh, repetitive of that population also gave us, the second population of the same cross gave us its uh, recessive uh, gene. So these are the pathotype numbers, uh, what we call then uh, pathotype names, what we use in Australia, what we used to use. So this is the kind of recessive resistance what we got. That was the resistant gene. If you look at here, this is the kind of resistance. And the reaction was 1, 2, double minus C. This is a resistance reaction. And here, next to that, we have susceptible plant. Because in F2, if you put seeds of a F2 plant, again, it will segregate in F3 progeny. If it is a single gene, it has to segregate in 3 is to 1. 
in this case one will be resistant smaller smaller capital or capital or and capital or smaller will be susceptible so in the same pot if you put 20 seeds so you will get four resistant plants and 16 susceptible plants that indicates that there is single recessive gene is present in that population so we sent that for 90k snp bid array uh, the f3 uh, uh, dna so we got, we have got the information and this gene is under uh, naming process we are naming this gene in future so like that i said two more lines which i was using we expected some reaction and we were expecting that wire 4 or wire 5 gene will be there it was resistant we don't know what is there but based on the reaction it may be wire 4 or wire 5 something like that you will imagine it may be wire 4 wire 5 the best thing you can do is you run wire 4 wire 5 marker on that population if it is giving negative for wire 4 and wire 5 that means this is something else than that so you can develop mapping population and you do this one so one more mapping uh, like identification of marker sr26 is a stem rust resistant gene which is effective against all the races of african uz99 it's the aggressive pathotype available uh, until now in india ttksk pathotype what we call so we had 30 130 recombinant inbred lines of this one and the resistant was giving one minus and uh, susceptible was three plus we wanted to identify a marker snp codominant and repetitive across the laboratory marker for this gene then we sent that for tgbs so in australia i said about 9k i said about 90k in india we have 35k they have 12k one more marker uh, array that is targeted uh, gene based sequencing uh, genotype uh, array that screens only for the genic uh, reasons coding reasons so this map gave us uh, four markers which were very close to sr26 and this sr26 came as a translocation from agile uh, agropyran elongatum so this translocation was the large translocation in our set s the plant which we used as a donor and uh, there was one more small translocation in wild abortive one so that CASP uh, 224 and 225. These two markers are SNP based markers. You can run it on, run it um, in any, any laboratory for that matter is concerned. So we developed a marker. So what is next step? You have to validate it. So we, this marker we validated across the mapping populations which are having SR26 in there, which is segregating. So SR26 is segregating. Along with that, my project was having that to integrate this SR26 into Indian uh, Indian uh, wheat cultivars, three cultivars I have taken. So once I did F2, once I went until F2, I have to go for back process. Na? So so as to select uh, SR26 homozygous resistant plant out of segregating, I, we use this marker. Wherever you see this kind of color, orange color, it shows that SR26 is in homozygous condition, that plant. It is very difficult to differentiate this one and this one phenotypically. So this marker completely validated my population by, say, uh, by showing the difference between homozygous resistant and ho heterozygous resistant plants. Next one. Okay. okay. Sorry. So if you see here, this was the parent one, this was the parent two. SR26 is coming from both the parents. Imagine if the SR26 is coming from one parent, it will segregate and it will not be present in a homozygous resistant condition. If it is coming from both the parents, you will have a copy from both the parents in the segregating, you will have in F2, you will get homozygous resistant, homozygous susceptible, uh, uh, like uh, heterozygous resistant and susceptible. So that is differentiated here. Wherever SR26 is coming from both the parents, you get this one, yay, yay. Okay? And uh, wherever it is not coming from one, either of the one parent, you will, you will not get homozygous resistant. That means that this marker is exactly going with the right of your interest so we did we checked our uh, uh, material for resistance we did a genetic analysis we did uh, population development for that we did location of the gene we did mapping of that gene we identified the marker for that as a respective gene so what is the next process is use that gene and the marker you have to introduce that gene by using that marker into your cultivars so this was the project I had with uh, Australia. So these were the steps for effective introgression because I had it for two years. 
So within two years, we, uh, we were having a lot of objectives to achieve. So we went for uh, use of speed breeding approach and you double upload production to get the lines fixed for uh, multiple genes. So we first tested effectiveness of target genes. Why effectiveness target genes is? Material is for India. We have to use that resistant gene in India. You don't know whether that resistant gene is resistant to Indian pathotypes. Australian pathotypes is something different. Indian pathotypes is something different. Maybe that gene is resistant to Indian pathotypes also. So you have to characterize that gene for Indian pathotypes. We did characterizing the target gene. Then we developed backrest derivatives and double haploids. Then high throughput phenotyping we did for them. Followed by screening of background genes. You have some foreground genes, but still your varieties will be having some of the background genes that I will explain. Then you can develop a triple rest resistant. Can you imagine if you release a variety which is having only susceptible resistance to yellow rust, is it useful? Because there are so many areas like Delhi, we have, we will get leaf, uh, stem, uh, uh, stripe rust majorly and leaf rust in later stages. So you have to have multiple rust resistance that we call as a triple rust resistant lines. So you, when you release those varieties, you will be having a surety that it will go very far ahead uh, in breeding, uh, this one, production progress. So next, you have to go for large scale multi-location testing. Even if you were putting a gene into your material, whether if it is not performing very well in the uh, yield trials, it will not go into useful. It will not be useful for you. So the project was development of high quality rust resistant lines. We had uh, six genes, YR51, 57, YR47, linked to LR52, SR26, 22, and SR50 for stem rust resistance. All these genes are effective against Indian pathotypes. We wanted to transfer these genes into these three Indian varieties, which are which were famous varieties, and few of them um, still in the breeder seed production uh, pipelines. So this is the process what we followed. Uh, if you see in next uh, slides, this is the overall plan of our uh, thing. So Indian wheat varieties were these three, and Australian donors were uh, for resistant genes. And first we went for uh, developing backrest BC2 F1 and BC2 F2. Uh, then uh, we screened them phenotypically, and then we did background selection for other genes. Then we uh, ended up with developing double haploids, F2, and triple and double crosses, which are having triple rust resistant flavor in their blood. So we shipped that material to India last year. We got it and we evaluated those materials. So before that, uh, high throughput phenotyping is very important. High pro throughput phenotyping, because you have to evaluate large number of lines, and even you have to evaluate it against uh, different countries' pathotypes we have to, if you have to use it for other countries too. So individually, these will differ uh, as far as uh, rusts are concerned. Stripe rust needs different temperature regime, and leaf rust needs some separate, and uh, stem rust also needs separate temperature regime. So they have very high throughput, not like uh, in India, we are um, still we are a bit far um, behind. So we can show these uh, in, um, uh, in pots, uh, peat pots, then you grow them in germination chambers. They have different chambers for germination. After 10, 12 days of germination, two to three lip stage, you will inoculate it. Inoculation also, they have different chambers, mist chambers and all. Incubation you can do. Incubation chambers are different for stem rust, leaf rust, and stripe rust based on the temperature requirement of that. Then you can shift to microclimatic rooms, they will be there until the development of the disease and uh, you screen them. So these were the markers. Once we did phenotyping of those, we did uh, two levels of genotyping. One was uh, genotyping for the genes of our interest. And second genotyping for genes of not our interest, but still they are segregating in our population. We were expecting LR26 is there, SR2, LR34, it's adult plant resistant genes, which is there and which is the prominent genes used by most of the breeders in India. YR4 already there in India, Indian in this one, and YR15 is efficient in Indian uh, for stripe rust. So these were the markers which we uh, used. If you are targeting any of these genes, you can use these high throughput markers. So SNP, uh, I, I was talking about SR26, the mark earlier why, what we used to use is SR26 number 43. But in between of my program, we developed a marker, a SNP marker, as yes, a uh, CAST 224 that we used uh, in our uh, further studies. So you're doing uh, introgression, glasses, phenotyping, and genotyping, but still you have to evaluate your lines for uh, field conditions also. Because what you evaluate inside the glasses condition, what you get outside in natural condition is something different. 
because there are number of new pathotypes are keep on developing. Uh, we know in uh, India for yellow rust, there are some pathotypes which are freely available. Some pathotypes already have been collected and they are contained not to allow them to be used by breeders to evaluate and they spread outside the uh, outside in natural environments. So to evaluate our lines for natural uh, available pathotypes, we did it. Uh, there were two locations. One was I was placed at Sydney location. So we did we took one uh, evaluation program in Sydney near Sydney. Uh, one was uh, 520 kilometers away from Sydney. There was a place uh, called Narabri. Uh, we have a uh, uh, Watson Plant Breeding Institute there. And most of the Australian program, grain research program is happening there. They evaluate material there. We get a lot of rust there. And for yield also, you can evaluate your material. And you all know here we get labels and all to take care of our work. But there, uh, you have to work all alone, starting from sowing, observations, harvesting. You can sit in the harvester and you can harvest, bring them to the storage and you will store it. That's the kind of system they have and it is very highly sophisticated system. So once you make the background selection of these genes, you will prepare the panel like this. So you know the first backrest line which you prepared for, uh, developed for wire 47 and you know in the background we have three, four more genes. SR2 is there. Uh, yellow 34 is there and wire 4 is there. This kind of genes you will do for, use it for large scale uh, crossing program. Then is hybridization. Once you have a single gene line, then you go for hybridization. So if you see here, it was a single gene like SR22, 1, BC2, F2. We crossed with B, uh, wire 57. So it is having two genes in the F1 blood. Then, then F1, we grew it in the field in the main season and we crossed to develop a mega F1. It is having SR2 genes and this F1 is having two genes. You are bringing it together in F1, it will again segregate. What you do is you harvest the cross, mega F1 cross, and you sow it in the glass houses. We did a sowing in the glass house and under controlled condition in the off season. Individual plant is individual mega F1 seed. Individual seed will go into segregate and you have to catch hold of that F1 where your all genes are segregating. That's the thing. It's very difficult to do a step every, every uh, uh, generation. But in one generation, if you catch hold of, and we selected few lines which are having triple rust resistant genes. And uh, those were genotyped and uh, they were selected and they were shipped to India. So this is the kind of lines you will develop. In the background of PBW550, there was a line initially SR22. We crossed it with a uh, wire 57. F1 was, F1 was having these two. And there was one more wire 47 linked to LR52. Leaf rust resistance is also coming together. We crossed these two and we developed a triple cross. And that triple cross, we grew it, hundreds of triple uh, that F1s, and we selected for SR2247 wire 57. The plant which are having all these three, three genes were selected. And that will be grown in progenies and just next time you multiply seed and you will keep on uh, processing that generation by generation in the plot so you can, exp you can um, take out uh, best line out of it. So one more method was double haploid, what we call in wheat. We have a wheat maize system of double haploid. So there are two genes, one is in P1, one is in P2. You have to cross and you have to make back crosses, six generation of back crosses. Then you will get fixed line for those two genes. But in double applied, what happens is you will cross wheat, which is having uh, wheat F1, which is having two genes. For example, SR22, 26, just cross it. You will have a F1, which is having SR22 and uh, SR26 together. You will take the pollen of maize, you put it on the wheat plant, wheat uh, ear, stigma. What happens is in the next generation, when the zygote is formed, uh, the chromosomes of maize will be degenerated, okay, uh, that is digested. So you will be having haploid number of chromosomes from only wheat. So this embryo you get, that we call it as a caryopsis. And that caryopsis will be doubled using colchicine, then double haploid seed will be produced. It takes only one year. You imagine taking three, four years to develop B, uh, back cross, and this can be done in one year if you have a sophisticated facility. For this, we use speed breeding approach. 
what happens in spirit breeding approach is you grow, uh, you grow maize under control conditions. Maize cannot be grown in cooler temperature, you know that. So now if you sow it uh, in November, it won't, it won't grow also. And wheat will be grown in cooler temperatures now in rabi conditions. So if you want to make maize and wheat, it, it is very difficult in India. So you have to grow maize in controlled conditions, grow your wheat in fields, just you make the crosses and develop double haploids. This system is not yet explored much in, uh, there is one institute which is doing, but uh, it's not much explored in Indian conditions. So the next one is vernalization room we use. But you know maize flowering and wheat flowering is entirely different uh, con conditions. We, use, uh, we used vernalization and light to control the flowering regime of wheat. Then you can cross maize and wheat and to develop a haploid where a chromosome of uh, maize is gen uh, degenerated. Then you can culture that caryopsis embryo uh, in the tissue culture and you can harden those plants what, after getting two leaves. Then you can treat with colchicine to multiply the chromosomes of uh, wheat. Then you will have a double haploid where these will be having uh, two genes fixed in one year. So the overall program was this. We started with backcross uh, lines. So high throughput phenotyping we did, then genotyping for the foreground selections and background genes, other genes, uh, APRs, and some pro quality work also we did. Then we select, we developed through single crosses and double crosses. We had double haploids, which are already fixed, double crosses, triple crosses, still they are segregating and we are selecting in the field. And we have F2. All these we shifted to India and we are evaluating this. So we had taken multi-location trials at two locations, Sydney and uh, Narabri. So if you look at here, the lines which we developed and shipped to India, this is the agro-local susceptible. Uh, it's not very clear, but this one, see, if it is completely um, clean from uh, the disease. Nothing, not a single spot you can see on the, uh, this one. So this is also one more picture of that. Uh, we, were, we were growing them in the uh, progeny rows. Now we have shipped them to uh, plots, individual plots, larger plots to analyze their yields. This is the kind of segregation you get in triple cross or double crosses because too many number of genes are segregating and uh, phenotypically you have to select. Genotypically it is very difficult to go. Uh, disease resistance is something fantastic that uh, it's phenotypically easily uh, selectable uh, trait. So this is a susceptible plant came out of this line and this is a resistant plant which is very good with the performance for the uh, plant type. And this can be discarded and this can be forwarded to the next generation. These are few other. For few other. So what is next? We have already uh, shipped these lines into India, but uh, there were uh, some issues that few of the lines we could not ship to Australia due to some, uh, uh, some issues of re plant registration. So we are uh, taking up a project to transfer these genes again into uh, leading wheat cultivars of four zones because we have three kinds of rust resistant genes we are shipping them. Also double haploid we are exploiting in India. As I said, we are growing uh, maize in phytotron. We are trying whether we can be successful in developing caryopsis. At least we develop caryopsis, then that can be pipelined through tissue culture uh, protocol. So in conclusion, what I say is uh, understanding all these concepts of wheat and the rust is very important. The kind of variation is present in the pathotype, how, how wider its adaptation is, and how, how aggressive the pathogen is going like stem rust using 99, uh, for example, and uh, deployment of major and mi minor uh, genes together. If you are targeting only one gene for a particular rust, it will, it will be knocked out one or other day in the future. Uh, there are so many examples happening uh, even in India. So always it is better to go for major and minor uh, uh, the QTLs integration into one. So definitely high throughput phenotyping and genotyping are very essential and they will take us uh, forward in developing and delivering triple rust resistant gene, uh, wheat varieties in coming years. For references, if you wish to, uh, if you want to uh, have a basic information of wheat rust, so a paper came in 1995, wheat rust, uh, an atlas of resistant genes by Bob McIntosh. Still he is 90, uh, now he is in 92. He comes to office at 6 o'clock in the morning. He leaves at 11 o'clock. He is the one who names all the genes of uh, different kinds of rust all over the, globally. So uh, there is one review from uh, my supervisor there and we have few publications so that can be referred. 
Thank you so much. If you have any questions, you can. <coughs> Finished in time. Yes. Is it fine if like male children could uh, become double as well? Only male children. So we have different uh, system of uh, double apple production. Like uh, we are trying for different crops. But as far as wheat is concerned, there are two uh, uh, methods until now we have uh, exploited. One is crossing wheat with maize. What happens, as I showed in the um, slide, so you have a wheat chromosome. There are 42 chromosomes uh, are there, 21 homologs. So when you cross two parents, wheat and wheat, okay, 21 chromosomes are contributed by your uh, pa parent one. 21 chromosomes will be contributed by parent two. So they will come together, it becomes a exoploid wheat. 42 chromosomes, totally it will be. So what happens is, uh, when you cross wheat into wheat, you will get a complete set of chromosomes. So you want to transfer, uh, there are two genes, you want to fix it. So parent one is donating one gene, first gene, parent two is donating second gene. So you will make crosses. So they will come in heterozygote condition. Then you will do back crosses to fix those genes, both the genes all together into one, one line. So it takes six years of your effort or six generations you need. Even if you use off season, you need three years. What happens in maize is, you have a parent, you just develop F1. No need to go for six back crosses. You have a F1, there is uh, two genes, one second, first and second gene, they are in heterozygote condition like this. So when you cross it with maize, okay, cross it with maize, maize will also contribute uh, two genes, like uh, um, uh, its chromosomes. But that chromosome will be degenerated in the first F1 itself. Embryo will not be developed. That embryo will be a watery embryo, what you get, that we call it as a caryopsis. There you will not be having chromosomes of this one. Uh, yes, chromosomes of the maize. So it will be degenerated. You will have a haploid number of chromosomes of the wheat only. So in that condition, you have a F1, like uh, of wheat and maize, you have a F1 where your genes are sitting in opposite uh, positions, like both are in heterozygote. Then what you do is you treat it as a colchicine because that is a haplo haploid. You will be have a one copy of that chromosome. You will treat it with a colchicine. It will multiply, or like it will uh, duplicate. So one copy of this gene, one copy of this gene sitting on the chromosomes, uh, all 21 will go into uh, copy themselves. So that becomes homologous, like uh, second copy is created. So those two genes will be fixed in your double haploid line. So maize is used just to create a haploid of, haploid um, embryo of wheat. In a haploid embryo, both the genes will be there. They will be in heterozygote uh, uh, condition, but only one copy will be there. The second copy will not be there of homologous chromosome. Then you double it with a colchicine, the second, of, second copy of all the chromosomes will be produced. Now that time, that gene copy also, it becomes a second time. So two copies of that gene you will be having and that is fixed. You go on selfing the double haploid, you won't get changes in those genes because they are already fixed, they will segregate. They won't segregate in the population. Yes, got it. No, all were exoploid uh, land races. Yes. And the process of uh, pertaining the sputum into uh, into the anti vector or uh, they were in different group cooking into the vector. First, uh, actually, this work initiated uh, through a project, ASCRP project, what they had with uh, Australia, Australia and India. There was a collaboration project. So their their objective was to develop uh, rust resistant lines for India. 
using novel resistant genes which were identified in Australia. YR5157 which I took, uh, they were uh, identified nearly uh, during 2013-14. I went there in 2016. There was a student uh, Randhva, um, so now he is in Simit. So he developed, uh, he identified those two in uh, Australian land races. So those land races uh, were crossed to Indian uh, varieties. So first we developed, you know, they developed BC2F2. When I went there, I got a BC2F2 uh, for my project. But by BC2F2, almost our lines were fixed. Na? Uh, like Indian uh, background has been uh, uh, recovered there. So those lines I used. Those lines will be already uh, performance wise, yield wise, they will be very good. No need to select for yield. But you have to select it for only foreground. That's why we didn't go for background selection, what we call background selection here. So you can avoid that one. Uh, if you do not have money, what is the other way to do? Uh, to do run a project. What you will do is you will you, uh, have a land this. People say foreground, background, foreground, background. But one more thing is you can do simultaneous backcross when you concentrate on two genes. Just you cross it with the land race. You go on, keep on going for backcrosses. At the end of BC2, you have to you cross those two. Already in both the single backcrosses, you have recovered the genome of your cultivars. So if you cross those two, they will be very good with the performance, yield wise agronomic traits, and they will be having those genes. Yes. And how about that uh, uh, recovering BC2 F2 like uh, Yeah, it was nearly 83, 80, 82 percent. That paper has been already published uh, because that work I didn't do. Uh, BC2, until BC2 F2, uh, they have done it. They have done the background selection for uh, these lines and the foreground selection and it's published in agronomy journal. So it's nearly more than uh, 80, 83 percent uh, uh, recovery was there. So 83 percent recovery, uh, more than 83 percent recovery in all of these and we crossed those um, backcross lines having different uh, resistant genes in their uh, blood and we combined them into make them into triple rust resistant. Yeah, I would have uh, uh, like presented that data, but it's already published on it. Someone saw it, so I could not take it. We have uh, already got uh, monosomics. Earlier they used to use, now also people are using monosomics are available already. So maybe you have heard of Sears, uh, they have uh, developed in USA. So they have monosomic series for all the chromosomes in wheat. So you, you use those monosomic series and uh, when uh, that chromosome is just, it's a principle of that chromosome is present or it is absent. You will have a monosomic uh, line you crossed with uh, your uh, line of interest that is particular chromosome is missing and uh, your how many how much of resistant resistance you are getting in the progenies so if that particular chromosome is missing and you are not getting susceptible uh, you are not getting resistant if it is present in especially that you, uh, for example for 5d when 5d is there you are getting more number of resistant lines if 5d is absent then you are not getting that indicates that gene particular gene resistant gene is present on that chromosome. That's the principle of that. Yeah, actually the main problem of double applied production in wheat is survivability. And uh, until making crosses is not a issue. Uh, you take a wheat F1, uh, heterozygote it will be, and you cross it with a maize. Uh, once you put it uh, that embryo what we call caryopsis. There is a watery uh, bulb uh, mm, what we call tube in that uh, you know, single one or two embryos you get. Once you culture it on a culture media, so few of them will die due to infection or something uh, under the tissue culture laboratories and few of them will generate, uh, degen uh, regenerate into two leaf stage. So once they are in two leaf stage, you can't grow it continuously on a media. You have to shift them to the soil uh, and uh, you have to add on them. So once you shift them to 
the soil, they definitely many of them will die. So that recovery percent is too low. If you make 100 carrier abscess line, um, in Indian studies they get 20, 25. They will be survived as a haploid plants. Okay. So a haploid plant has to uh, converted into uh, a well established haploid plant, and that can be that should be treated with the colchicine. After that, again you have to cut the leaves. And again, it has to establish and it has to produce seeds, haploid seeds. That is too much of uh, energy, um, even a plant will not be having that much of energy and still you are giving uh, that, much, that much of uh, protocols, definitely you will lose. But in Australia, they have a very good protocol, step by step protocol and it is 24 into 7 work. They work until 9, 9.30 in the uh, night because they have uh, um, indents from private companies to produce double haploids. Uh, they are not producing double haploids only for making uh, these genes to fix in their populations. Double haploid for breeding purposes also. Like in uh, normal breeding what we do, we cross two plants, two better yielding plants. You will have a F1 and then you will get F2. What we do is you will select individual F2 plants based on the performance of those plants. Then you will try to harvest individual plants and you take until um, F6. Okay, individual plots, uh, that is six generations of uh, selfing to make that line fixed as far as F2 is concerned. F2 performance, if you see, that will be shown in F6. So instead of going for so many generations of selfing, F6 advancing uh, this one and fixing that F2 plant, they use uh, double haploid. Once they get the F, F1, they, multi they harvest the F2 seeds. F2 seeds will be converted into double plots. What happens is within one season, you will make that plant as same as looking in F6. That's the advantage of this. And uh, yes, this is very uh, uh, problematic issue in that one, the regeneration. But still, they could get more than 50% of plants uh, which, which can survive after tissue culture and after uh, colchicine treatment and all. And ultimately, if you make uh, uh, if you culture 100 embryos of haploid, ultimately you will get 50, 55 embryos, uh, uh, double haploid plants. Yeah. Individual double haploid plant will produce nearly 10 to 20 seeds. So those individual uh, seeds, you can put it in the uh, progenies and you can evaluate. Uh, actually, uh, the, there is a process. Uh, once the plant is haploid, it well establishes and it produces the tillers. So you are not giving the colchicine treatment to the seed, developing embryo. You are giving colchicine treatment to the root of that. You will cut the haploid plant into off. You will remove everything which is already reproductive or something. You will cut it. So it was there in the photo. You will cut it and dip that in the colchicine. Uh, solution. We normally use 0.01 to 0.03 uh, percent of colchicine. When you dip that into the plant, uh, colchicine for three hours, so what happens is plantary uh, plant has been cut already and the root will start absorbing the colchicine into its uh, system. So instead of converting or giving colchicine to the reproductive uh, tissues, we are directly making the plant to absorb it and taking it into its blood. So every tiller, every root, every leaf, every cell of that plant will be converted. And especially even that established haploid plant may not be uh, doubled. Whatever regenerates from there, cell production happens, then tiller comes, then reproductive organs will be formed, seed will be formed. For all that process, you have to have a mitosis and meiosis. So that pro in the, all those new cells created, the chromosomes will be doubled there. So whatever the seed you get, that will be having a doubled chromosome numbers. Yeah, that. So you're creating stress for the plant to absorb colchicine into its blood. It's not giving specific injection like uh, what we give it for making stun or some, uh, if you want to remove teeth, they give to some particular area. Just this will be uh, made it very not sensible. But you're giving it the whole body when you do operations. That's the difference we have. So whole plant system is uh, treated with that. Anything else? Are we done? Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Hi. 
है सर ठीक है थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू कॉलिंग थैंक यू सो मच हाँ वो एक्चुअली ना थोड़ा फर्स्ट हाँ वो क्या हुआ था एक महीने से पहले मुझे तो मेल आया था 